Decided to do a video on ancient churches of Ethiopia. Now this is really on the, um, I guess I say the, the origins of the Ethiopian church, Ethiopian Christianity, and the conscious community has been an excuse and a misnomer that Christianity came from Ethiopia. That's where the black Jesus comes from, so on, so on. It's become a crutch for us to keep this oppressionist religion in our community. And I hope this helps a few minds break free. So if you know anybody of Ethiopian Greek Orthodox religion, let them check this out. So I got this off the UNESCO government site. They're like a um, World Heritage Preservation Organization. They make sure shit don't get fucked up. So this is about the uh, rock hewn churches in the Lalibela, Ethiopia. It says they are still preserved in their natural settings right here. Which means they ain't been reconstructed, none of that. So everything I show you in these temples is, is exactly how they was when they was built. The association of the rock hewn churches in the traditional vernacular circular houses in the surrounding area still demonstrate evidences of, evidences of ancient village layout. The original function of the site as a pilgrimage place still persists and provides evidence of a continuity of social practices. The intangible heritage, heritages associated with church practices are still preserved. So everything that came along with the Christian church are still preserved here as it begun. So let's continue. This is the side of the uh, Lal Lalibela Ethiopian Orthodox Church. They got this big white Jesus up here, a few saints up here on the wall. They do got some black angels on the roof or whatever, and some murals and stuff that we're going to get into later. There goes another view right here. You see the angels on the roof. You got Mary here with baby Jesus. Jesus. The black saints. The black angels. But Jesus is white. Now I want you to remember that this stuff hasn't changed. So if you haven't seen my video on Christianity, pause this video and go back and watch it before you continue. It, this will make so much more sense after you watch it. This is a stat, uh, carving slash statue that's uh, equipped to the Lalabella um, temple. And as you see here, you have the Roman cross. The same Catholic cross that's still being used today. So I want to check this out. This is involving the paintings that we will see inside the temples. The emergence of an Ethiopian medieval painting tradition. The disintegration of Axum centralized economy and its coinage in the 9th century involved the disappearance of an archaeologically recognizable political and cultural center. Possible successor chiefdoms are being investigated, for instance, at Degum in the Gar Garata area of Tigray, with its complex of subterranean structures reminiscent of Axumite funerary church architecture. Evidence of painting production, however, only seems to reemerge later in the context of the southward shift of power to the Lasta region, which was the seat of the Agal speaking 
Zagwe dynasty from the 9th century until its replacement by the Amharic speaking Solomonic dynasty 1270. This period of transformation of Askamite and post Askamite culture into the so called medieval civilization of Christian Ethiopia is marked by important cycles of wall paintings decorating rock hewn churches and centers of Zagwe power. So basically, that's telling you that you can see the change of culture due to these medieval wall paintings. So how did medieval art get into Ethiopia? We're going to get into that as well. Here's what the Ethiopian Orthodox Church calls St. George. It's St. George slaying the dragon. And the dragon in medieval times was synonymous sometimes with the devil. So, and even there's even instances where St. George instead of killing a dragon it shows him killing a crocodile and I'm gonna have to find that and post it on, on in the group for you guys it shows him killing the crocodile and the crocodile was one of the totems of the pre-christian Ethiopians so here goes St. George here killing the the dragon so where did this come from here on the right is a different mural of St. George killing the dragon than I previously showed so England's patron saint of 4th century Christian martyr is also patron saint of Georgia and the city of Moscow. Very little is known about the real St. George. He is thought to have been born into a noble Christian family in the late 3rd century in Cappadocia, an area which is now in Turkey. He followed his father's profession of soldier and became part of the retinue of Emperor Diocletian. The emperor ordered the systematic persecution of Christians and George refused to take part. In 303, he was himself tortured and executed in Palestine, becoming an early Christian martyr. So he was deified by the Christians because of this. And changed black by the Ethiopians. So, you, so if you've seen the Christian video I did before this, you'll see how the misnomer came from these things went from black to white the only thing that they took was our culture and put their spin on it when they put their spin on it we took this, this the spent side instead of keeping our culture as it was we took what they turned white and turned it black so when they made Serapis and made him Jesus Christ after the Council of Nicaea, we made him black. All right, so these are also inside the um, the, the uh, Ethiopian temple, and here we have the Templar cross right here with the with the Star of David and the double-headed eagle. Now the Hittites had worshipped the double-headed eagle as the king of heaven who was also called the Hittite bird of the sun the bird was their symbol to signify Hitt Hittite military power so that is why the Romans stole it to signify military power and I want you to remember that remember that this is inside their church and I want y'all to remember that it signifies a military power So here it, is, here it is right here, the double-headed eagle on the left is a seal of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Constantinople. So um, remember that because all of these is going to connect when I, when I get through this lecture. Many historians think ancient civilizations were so impressed with the symbol that they copied it and used it as their own. So this is the Roman Empire double-headed eagle right here as well with Jesus Christ hanging in the middle. Now we're going to get into a little archaeology. This is a double-headed eagle representation that Sir Cap Stuka, the Indo-Greek archaeological site in Pakistan, 1st century BC to 1st century AD. So you can see that it was using this double-headed eagle previously to the Ethiopians. Very recently. 
So the double-headed eagle, an everlasting symbol of power. The double-headed eagle has been a popular symbol associated with the concept of a powerful empire. Most contemporary uses of the symbol are exclusively associated with its use by the Byzantine Empire and the Greek Orthodox Church. However, the double-headed eagle has been in use for thousands of years, way before the Greeks identified it with the Byzantine Empire and Orthodox religion, while its original meaning is debated among scholars. But we know what they used it for. We don't know before the Hittites, pretty much. The eagle was a common symbol representing power in ancient Greek city-states. In Greek mythology, now that's important. Now, we just seen the eagle inside the Ethiopian church. Now, it's an important symbol representing power in ancient Greek city states. In Greek mythology, there was an implication of a dual eagle concept in the tale of Zeus that let two eagles fly east and west from the ends of the world with them eventually meeting at Delphi, thus proving it to be the center of the earth. በአብርሃም እና አጽሃ ዘመነ መንግስት የነበረው የክርስቲና እምነት ያዲስ ክርስቲና ስለሆነ አዲስ ተባረ ነበሩ የሆነ ሆኖ ግን በጣም ተንካራ ነበር በጣም ተንካራ የሆነ የክርስቲና እምነት ነበር ከዛ በኋላ ግን በይበል ተሳፋ እንጂ ዳንግዲም ቢሆን በመጀመሪያ የመራጊ ይሆን ጥሩ ጥሩ ግስቃሴ ጥሩ so this is where that shit come from. So let's get into how Christianity made its way into Ethiopia. The Alexandria, excuse me, this comes from a book, Culture and Customs of Ethiopia. So you know I don't use any biased sources. I'm not looking for sources to intentions, intentionally disprove something. The Alexandrian Patriarch appointed Frumentius as the first bishop of Axum in AD 340. <clears throat> Frumentius was happily received in Axum and succeeded in converted King Izana to Christianity. Frumentius is known in Ethiopia as Abba Salama, father of peace, and Kasat Brahan, revealer of life. He is canonized as a saint by the Ethiopian Orthodox, Roman, and Greek churches. There is a church dedicated to him in Timbin in southern Tigray. The conversion of Izama, Izana to Christianity is clear from his Christian inscription written in Gi's language. Before this, we have the pagan inscriptions of Izana where he says that he was the son of Maram. Now if you look here at the bottom under the the um the cover page, I have a note that lets you know Maram was a moon god, god of war from the Abyssinians. So Izana's Christian inscriptions start with the invocation that says in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Ghost he also says that he was the son of Jesus Christ thus his honor lived both as a pagan and as a Christian ruler traditionally it is believed that Abraha Izana and Atzbaha Sazana were co-regents and both of them are believed to have accepted Christianity now Sazana is his twin brother now I want you to think about this. Inside those early Christian temples, you have this double-headed eagle that represents Roman power. Now, Izana ruled as both a pagan and Christian ruler, and he was the one that converted to Christianity first. Okay, as an Ethiopian ruler. So there's where we have the the change in the timeline when Ethiopia left its officially left its culture and went on to Christianity there was Christianity practiced in Ethiopia before this point obviously because Frumentius basically tutored him as a child 
what what this doesn't what this source uh, left out was Prometheus was previously captured by Izana's father. So as a slave, he was made to tutor Izana, but while tutoring him, he was pushing a Christian agenda. So when he got older, it was easy to to convert Izana to Christianity. Now, continuing uh, where we left off at, both of them are canonized as saints by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. This makes Ethiopia the first country where Christianity was planted as an official religion in the royal court. Thus, Christians were not persecuted. This is why you see St. George being venerated as a saint in Ethiopia as well. The conversion of Izana is also confirmed by the letters of Alexandrian Patriarch. Izana also received a letter from the Roman Emperor who asked him to accept the doctrine of Arianism. The coins of Izana also bore the symbol of the cross. Now you, I feel like this is avoided in lectures because of how it makes an Ethiopian king looks. It is exactly what it looks like him and his brothers sold out and I will show you how as this lecture goes on. Later toward the 5th century AD, Christian missionaries known as the Nine Saints came into Ethiopia. They are credited with the expansion of Christianity, building of churches and monasteries, and conversion of local population. They also translated most of the Bible into the Gies language. This is clear from the inscription erected in Yemen by Aksumite King Caleb in the 6th century AD. The inscription begins with a quote from Psalms 24:8, The Lord is strong and mighty, the Lord is strong in battle. This quote clearly indicates the existence of a Gies version of the Old Testament. So a lot of people are fooled or I don't know if they've been fooled, they just come up with the assumption that Ethiopia had the first Bible and that's where Christianity began and that's just not the case Ezana the king in his earlier time he wrote us inscriptions with other names of gods the dates we have considered as Aras, Maharan, Medea, but in a lot of them Okay, because this clearly shows that we are not a Christian. But later in his written period of reign, he left us several inscriptions which were clearly Christian inscriptions because they mentioned God the Father, God the Son, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and what have you. And he claimed to have been the Son of God. This clearly in case that he was converted to Christianity. So now we get into physical evidence that shows you Christianity, where Christianity had its real foot in the ground in Ethiopia. This is the Izana Stone. The monument is interesting for several reasons. First, it is one of the few ancient written records to come from pre-Islamic Africa, Egypt being the other major source of inscriptions. Second, the text on the Izana Stone is written in several languages. If you Google this monument, you will be told the monument is trilingual. Greek, which at the time was the lingua franca in many parts of the ancient world. Gies, an ancient Ethiopian language that is still a liturgical language of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. And others, and others, and Sabaim, an old South Arabian language used in what is now Yemen and in parts of Eritrea and northern Ethiopia. So this is a bilingual text. I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain what it says as well. Because obviously he wanted something to, be, to let it be known. So from AD 330 to 356, King Izana ruled the ancient kingdom of Aksum or Ethiopia centered in the Horn of Africa. Now listen to who he fought against. He fought against the Nubians. It commemorated his victories on stone tablets in praise of God. 
These liturgical epigraphs were written in various ancient languages. His carvings in stone provided a trilingual monument in different languages similar to the Rosetta Stone. It records trilingually the com conversion of King Izana to Christianity and his subjugation of other kingdoms. It sits in a simple stone hood surrounded by fields with a basic lock holding shut the tin door. So he wrote in several languages to let y'all know I'm converting to Christianity. Mind you, this is after the Council of Nicaea. So we're going to get into some more archaeology. Izana's early coinage repeats the pagan crescent and disc symbol, but, late, but his later issues substitute the Christian cross, possibly the first use of the symbol on coins anywhere. With the reign of Izana, 330 to 356 Axum into the new era he was the last pagan ruler so we look here on the left you see the African tributes you see the the moon disc and the sun moon disc and the sun don't forget he was worshiping the moon god now you look at the gold coins on the right and you see how his currency upgraded after he accepted Christianity the Romans broke him off. Now you see he got all his gold now. And he was even told that when he had the temples constructed, he asked the workers what did he want them to get paid. Like what you want to get paid. And that's because the, the Romans had threw so much gold at him he can afford to pay them whatever they wanted. They had sold out. So now he get these gold coins minted. Like his, like his Roman contemporary, Constantine the Great, Izana's conversion to Christianity was reflected on the coins. San Fermentius died 383. A Syrian slave revered as the founder of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church converted young Izana when he was the prince's tutor. Izana's early coinage repeats the pagan crest and disc symbol, but his later issues substitute the Christian cross. Now I want y'all to take a look at this coin. This is when he was allied with Rome, but still doing his pagan thing. He was still doing him. But he knew converting to Christianity was more like a political move. So here goes even more. So these silver dusty coins or intermediary coins. They were the coins that was more used in Ethiopia. When they had to deal with other countries and nations, they would switch to these uh, gold coins. So you can see the switch. Got the moon and sun disc on top and you switch to, and put the cross. Alright, so this is a golden crown and chalice initially acquired by Holmes from a soldier were deposited from the South Kenningson Museum by HM Treasury in 1872. Recent scholarship has suggested that they were commissioned by Empress Mente Wab for a church she founded in Gondor in 1740. Now this is the Crown Ethiopia 1740. It's gold alloyed with silver and copper with filigree work, glass beads, pigment, and gilded copper. Now this is a coin from the same era. Era. Excuse me. I'm trying not to live next. People uh people Pope <laughs> people. Pope Benedict 1740-1758. You look here, there's that crown. So you can see how the ties to Rome has still existed from the point where Izana sold out even until this day. So early Christianity, this is a weird source, hats and headwear, but it works. Early Christianity, 
A parallel process unfolded in Eastern churches during and after the Byzantine Empire. Coptic popes still headquartered in Cairo, Egypt wear black turbans. For Greek Orthodox clerics, the black veiled whatever that is is used. Orthodox leaders wear black as a sign of former subjugation of Christians under the Muslim Ottoman Turks. They will skip down to the second paragraph. Christianity spread southward to Ethiopia, where three tier crowns are still worn by clergy for holy day processions. The 14th century, some say 17th, Kibra Nagas chronicle claims that the Queen of Sheba of Ethiopian origin traveled to Jerusalem, met King Solomon, and gave birth to his son, thus creating the Solomonic line of Ethiopian kings. So now we have to approach the literary text because there's a big misconception that Ethiopia is Ethiopia's Bible is the oldest Bible and it's just not true. So they call them the Gospels of Abba Garima. The Gospels of uh, I'm gonna just say AG and I'm gonna start right here at this paragraph right here. The Gospels of A.G. have remained hidden for centuries in Ethiopian highlands in the A.G. Monastery, with no, which no woman may enter, according to tradition. God miraculously stopped the sun in the sky to allow St. Abba Garima to complete them in a single day. Their production has remained an enigma. Translated from Greek into Ethiopic, these gospels are the earliest testament of the lost art of the of the Christian culture of the Aksumite kingdom of Ethiopia, which flourished around 350 AD to 650 AD. Their vivid, finely painted illuminations are at once familiar, but also entirely exotic. By presenting for the first time in public all of the illuminated pages together in full color, this photo expedition aims to stimulate greater awareness and further study of these remarkable books, which are amongst the earliest and most important of the rare illustrated gospel books to have survived from antiquity. So remember that. The expedition accom accompanies the publication of the Garama Gospels, da -da 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 -da, which places the Garama Gospels firmly within the historical and artistic context of the late antique Mediterranean world. So these are supposed to be the originals. Everything I'm showing y'all on here is not like a some reconstructed. So here he go. He happy. He holding his Bible. And we already talked about all that. So here goes another source from Ethiopia history, culture, and challenges. Extensive destruction resulting from the excursions of the Muslim general Ahmad in the 16th century limits our understanding of this early painted production. Recent radiocarbon dating of the two parchment texts known as the Garima Gospels has delivered date ranges of 390 to 570 AD for Garima II and 536-30 AD for Garima I, the average of the midpoint of the two ranges being 530 AD. So this is well after the council, regardless of the date you choose. Pick a date within the range. This was a time of a of documented diplomatic exchange between the courts of Axum and Constantine, Constantinople. This suggesting that the flux of ideas could have led to the translation of the Greek Gospels into Gies and the introduction into northern Ethiopia of late antique of late antique techniques of book production and illumination. Stylistically and iconographically, the paintings of illustrating the Garima Gospels reflect these cultural and artistic exchanges and include common late antique themes such as portraits of the four evangelists, Garima II, and the depiction of the canon tables harmonizing the four Gospels. 
albeit expressed in a distinctly local visual language. So basically they're telling you that it made its way from Rome into Ethiopia and it's expressed in a distinctly local visual language which is why you're seeing black characters added into this Greek book. Continuing reading. In sub subsequent centuries the increasing numbers of missionaries arriving from the Eastern Roman Empire contributed to the spread of rigorous ascetic and monastic Mon monistic practices of Egyptian and Syrian origins, origin. Hermits began to occupy natural features in the mountainous northern Ethiopian landscape that would previously have been used for indigenous practices and churches began to be hewn into cliffs and caves, some which were later decorated with cycles of wall paintings. So where they were originally worshipping their regular culture and spirituality, the Christian movement had came in and changed all of that. So they don't even have nothing to remind themselves where they came from right now. Now this is a source worth reading. Now this comes from the Encyclopedia of Biblical, Theological, and Classical Literature, Volume 3. Now we go here to Ethiopic version. The libraries of Europe contain some, although very rarely complete, manuscript copies of a translation of the Bible into Guise dialect. This version of the Old Testament was made from the Greek of the Septuagint, according to the Alexandria Recension, as in, as in evinced, among other things by the arrangement of the biblical books and by the admission of the apocrypha without distinction so this is why that statement right there is why a lot of people be believe that the Ethiopian Bible is the original because they wrote it in a way where it looks like it's the Bible where the books were taken from because it has the apocrypha in it in all the pseudopigrapha that comes along they people assume that it's the original and that the King James version is the book that took away all those when in reality it's not that way at all now they even have tradition assigns it to Fermentius as the author so I mean that even takes away the myth of the nine saints and all that and that's what I meant to point out before because they have a dual history to this Ethiopian version and it's either Fomentius wrote it in, in the night or these nine saints came down and translated it into the language for them and this is another um, Bible encyclopedia, but this came from volume two. I'm just letting you know it says the same thing. Ethiopic version, the sacred language of the Ethiopians is called Gies, in which they have a translation of the entire Bible from the Septuagint in the Old Testament and from the original in the New. The oldest allusion to it of which we have any knowledge is by Christ and Storm. I cannot see it in his second homely on John. In its antiquity cannot be referred farther back than the fourth century during which Christianity was diffused among the people. That's all I wanted to show y'all. I hope we stop saying that the Bible came from Ethiopia. Thanks.